Yes, I wasn't, but now I am. Okay. Anyway, this is the Hall effect. And you imagine that these two things are flat conducting ribbons. And both of these things happen to be that. So um, here's one flat conducting ribbon and here's another flat conducting ribbon. And you put these things in a strong magnetic field. So, boy, in 1879, well, they knew about electromagnets, so they could have done it with uh, a, an electromagnet, maybe a large circular conductor with wire wrapped around it, actually a large piece of iron with wire wrapped around it, and another one below. And you could have a pretty uniform magnetic field between them. But let's just imagine that the uh, magnetic field in each case is just over some region of the flat ribbon conductor. And it doesn't have to be that big of a flat ribbon to detect this thing. So in each case, we'll have B, and it's going to go into the page. So, whoops, these are supposed to be X's. Um, so that'll be the magnetic field that's going on here. Now, their first, their thought at the time was that, well, they didn't know what the conductors were. The atomic model of matter wasn't even settled down yet. So, uh, the atomic model of matter was still debate, being debated 40 years after this experiment. So wasn't that big a, or wasn't that firmly entrenched, but let's just imagine that within this flat ribbon conductor, you have positive charges that are going in this direction. And so that's what comprises the electric current. Well, positive charges moving in a magnetic field Point your the force that'll be on each positive charge will be Q V cross B. So remember that. If the charges are moving to the right, V cross B is going to up, be up and Q is positive. So what'll happen in that case is you end up with a buildup of positive charge on the top edge of this conductor and on the bottom you'll have a buildup of negative charge because those positive charge charges left behind negative matter down here if it was overall neutral now this doesn't happen forever it doesn't build up forever but it reaches a certain point where in this case there would be a downward electric field in here and that downward electric field at some point will reach the point where it balances the magnetic force that's on the charges. And once that's the case, you'll end up with um, QVB is equaling to QE. And so uh, they'll be balanced and then you won't build up any more on there. However, if you have positive charge up here and negative charge down here, and you hook up a voltmeter to this thing, you'd register this side, this side is being a higher potential than this side, and so that's measurable. Now, on the other hand, if it's negative charges going in the opposite direction, and they didn't know which it was at the time, so if there are negative charges going in this direction, they'll experience the same thing except um, for them, V cross B, V is in that direction, B is into the page, V cross B is downward, but when you multiply that V cross B by a negative charge, you'll end up with the forces on the negative charge carriers, which they didn't call electrons yet. That'll push them up to here, and so you'll get negative charge building up here, and 
positive charge down here. And so when you hook up a voltmeter to this, you'll end up with the bottom part being at a higher potential than the top part. And this is what was observed, that you ended up with positive charge here and negative charge here. And that demonstrates that it's negative charges going through a conductor that are the charge carriers. So, and that's called the Hall effect. And it's not uncommon for me to ask on a test on magnetism to have you describe the Hall effect and be detailed. So anyway, that's the Hall effect. Way back in 1879, before they had even discovered the electron, um, before they were even calling them cathode rays, because they hadn't seen those either yet, and uh, long ways back. Okay, uh, something else I wanted to do was to um, look at a couple of applications of moving charges in magnetic fields. And the first one is for fusion reactors. You have two deuterium nuclei, and deuterium is the hydrogen isotope where in the nucleus of the hydrogen atom, there's not just a proton, but a proton and a neutron. So charge plus E, mass of just about twice that of a proton. Because a proton and a neutron have just about twice the mass of a proton. Anyway, they get close enough together. The attraction of the strong nuclear force will fuse them to make an isotope of helium, releasing vast amounts of energy. Well, not so vast in only one of those reactions, but if you can somehow get a whole bunch of them doing it at once, that could release vast amounts of energy. The range of this force is about 10 to the minus 15th meters. This is the principle behind the fusion reactor. The deuterium nuclei are moving much too fast to be contained by physical walls. Okay, the temperature is required for fusion comparable to that in the core of the sun, are above 10 million Kelvin, and that'll melt anything. So you can't have any physical contact between the, the particles in the thing. They have to be contained magnetically. So first of all, how fast would they have to move so that in a head-on collision, they would get close enough to fuse? Well, Let's imagine here that we've got a positive charge here and a positive charge here. And this one's moving at a speed V in that direction. And this one's moving at a speed V in this direction. And by the way, um, you can always find or select a coordinate system where the particles like this will have equal and opposite charges if they're moving toward each other. So you don't have to treat one as being at rest and the other as being the one moving. You can change coordinate systems to what's called the center of mass coordinate system for these two. And then you've got them both going at the, the same speed in opposite directions. So that's the idea here. Now, in this case, you'd have the kinetic energy, initial kinetic energy, one half mv squared plus one half mv squared is going to equal the final electric potential energy, which is going to be k sub e, e squared over r. Okay, and that's electric potential energy. It'd be q1, q2 times k sub e over r. And we know the R, it's 10 to the minus 15th meters. We know the charge on those things. Um, by the way, something I noticed on the, on the few tests that I've graded so far, um, actually still working on them, but uh, I'll finish those by tomorrow. But it's that uh, on a lot of the problems, I see people actually bothering to take one divided by four times pi times epsilon naught. And numbers are coming out weird. And one of my 
one thing I'm thinking is that um, maybe you're going one divided by four times pi times epsilon naught, and you're not wrapping these all these things in parentheses. And so your calculator is taking one divided by four, which is 0.25, and then multiplying the result by pi and multiplying that result by epsilon naught. So in effect, you're bringing these two things up to the top of the fraction. But you don't have to do that because this is equal to what we've been calling k sub e, which is just 8.99 times 10 to the ninth Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared. In fact, on the top page of the test, I had just this very same expression. And it may have been in a different order, but I had k sub e equals 8.99 times 10 to the ninth da 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 da, da equals 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. And this is a whole lot easier to punch into your calculator. You don't have to do any division and you're not going to make a mistake on it. So unless there's a reason to actually deal with that epsilon naught by itself, don't do that. If it's one over four pi epsilon naught you want, just do that. It's easier. All right, back to this thing. We'll have mv squared when I add those two together, is going to equal k sub e, e squared over r, or d squared, or actually I'll do two algebra steps at once here. v is going to equal k sub e, e squared over m times r. And these are deuterium nuclei. They gave me their mass here. So... That's what I'll have, and the R is just going to be 1 times 10 to the minus 15 meters. So take the square root of that whole works. Turn on calculator first. Make sure this works out. 8.99. E is 1.6. 10 to the minus 19th, and I square that and divide by, I have to wrap this in parentheses, 3.34 times 10 to the minus 27. Times R, 1E minus 15. And I get uh, 8.3. Actually, we've only got one sig fig here, but they're claiming two here, actually three on that. But I'm just going to call it uh, times 10 to the sixth meters per second. So let's see. Yeah, they've got the range of the force is about 10 to the minus 15th meters and about I should really just call it 8 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. In fact, I think I will. All right, so that fast, which is uh, 3 times 10 to the 8th divided by that. Um, okay, it's about 1 36th of the speed of light. So don't have to quite worry about special relativity yet. And that's something that's coming at the end of the quarter is the relativity thing. So what strength magnetic field is needed to make deuterium nuclei with this speed travel in a circle of radius 2.50 meters? So that might be the radius of whatever device, containment device they're forcing these deut deuterium nuclei to travel in which are sometimes called deuterons, by the way. Well, let's see, let's go back to um, F equals QVB equals MA equals MV squared over R. And we know the radius, they just gave it to us. Uh, we'll have QVB, equals mv squared over r and 
B will equal, divide both sides by V, and I'll have MV over QR. Yeah. All right. We can plug in the numbers here. Uh, 3.34 times 10 to the minus 27th kilograms times V, which I'm just going to call 8 times 10 to the 6th meters per second. We'll get a kind of an order of magnitude estimate for the, the uh, charge on here. Let's see, uh, Q, 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. So there's my coulomb, my R is 1 times 10 to the minus 15th meters. And I'm being careful to write that as 1 times 10 to the minus 15th meters. Because when you see something like this, there's a temptation to just go 10E minus 15 but that would be 10 times 10 to the minus 15th meters. So don't do that. And then if I multiply top and bottom of this by one over seconds, take this one over second and put it under that and I'll have an amp, a coulomb per second. So I'll have an amp meter on the bottom and a kilogram meter per second squared is a Newton. So I'll have a Newton per amp meter, which is a Tesla. So getting my units all lined up correctly. Took a little bit of work here. So let's see. Actually, this had ended up being 1.6 times 10 to the minus 34th. That's easier to divide by. Hmm. This isn't making, or maybe it is. Let's see, 10 to the minus 27, 8 times 10 to the minus 6. That'll be minus 21, approximately, minus 34. Yeah, I'm getting a really strong magnetic field. Um, 1.7, well, about 2, times 10 to the 14th. Tesla. That seems maybe unreasonable, although I'm pretty sure this speed is correct. Um, yeah, that's a really strong magnetic field. Um, hmm. Oh, wait, this isn't right. Um, this should have been 2.5 meters. Did you guys catch that or not? That's the problem. Okay, so. All right, be suspicious when you get an answer that's unreasonable. So I think I can go back to the last thing and go. Um, Okay, this should be more reasonable. Okay, not so bad, actually. It's uh, six, about seven times 10 to the minus two Tesla. Okay. And that's not too terrible, although it's got to be over a fairly large volume of space, but that's doable. So, although I'm wondering... Um, if they have them smack into a target that might have deuterium nuclei in place because uh, 
I don't know how you would get them orbiting in opposite directions. Hmm. Yeah, that doesn't, don't quite understand that. Okay. Um, this is one of the <clears throat> applications of magnetic fields is something called a mass spectrometer. And uh, when I was in graduate school, oh, for a, a year or so, I was considering working for this one laboratory that uh, did mass spectroscopy. And they actually floated mass spectrometers on balloons up into Earth's upper atmosphere and were looking at uh, ratios of different isotopes. But here's how a mass spectrometer works. Uh, you have some sort of a source, and this could just be a radioactive source or whatever, but you let material from that source come into a little chamber here. And this would be a really narrow opening. On the ones they flew on the balloons, they just had a a small hole drilled into this thing and most of it was vacuum inside here and they'd open it up only when they got to the upper atmosphere but anyway they'd come in here and then it enters a region here where there's what's called a velocity selector and the velocity selector oh you'd have to ionize the things first so what was sometimes in this part here was in an ionizing beam and it would be a beam of electrons that was shot sideways and those electrons would have just enough energy to knock electrons loose from the the source molecules they wouldn't have a lot of mass so they wouldn't deflect these things but anyway they'd knock electrons loose so now your particles coming in here were ionized and had positive charge. So that was the point of them. Then they enter this region right here that's called a velocity selector. And in the velocity selector, you have a magnetic field. And it could be the same as the magnetic field out here, or it could be a different value. But the main thing is it has to be pointing into this direction. And there's also an electric field pointing at 90 degrees with respect to that and with respect to the path. So when the positive ions are coming in here, this electric field pointing in this direction would tend to push them in that direction. But this magnetic field here, if I flip this around, the Velocity is in this direction, the magnetic field is that way, and the QV cross B would point in that direction, opposite the electric field. And when that's the case, when you get it balanced just right, you'll have that QVB, everything's 90 degrees in here. So uh, the angle between V and B is 90 degrees, and so the sine of 90 is 1. Anyway, but the QVB ends up equaling QE in magnitude, and the Qs divide about out, and you end up with the velocity that's selected for is equal to the electric field strength divided by the magnetic field strength. So now you've got particles with a particular velocity that are entering this region. Well, now, um, initially, they're going in this direction. Their V is in this direction. V cross B is inward, and V cross B remains at 90 degrees to their path all the time. And they travel in a perfect semicircle. And then you can start thinking about the... Uh, the QVB equaling MV squared over R, the radius of the path, and you measure the radius of their path by seeing which particle detector they hit. Actually, what you have in, in these things is you typically have a whole bunch of very narrow particle detectors that if they register a particle hitting them, 
the particle will have traveled a particular radius circle to hit it, and you just determined the radius, um, you selected for a particular speed, you know what the charge on them is, they're typically singly ionized. In your ionizer, you don't have enough energy to doubly ionize them. So you know what the Q is, you know what the V is, you know what the B is. The only thing you don't know in this equation is the mass of them, and that's how you determine it. And these things can be amazingly accurate. You can measure the mass of things to one part in a million, and so they can end up with six significant figures on the masses of things. And that's how they've carefully measured the masses of different isotopes. All right, well, let's see what the the problem is that they assigned about this. And uh, says the electric field between the plates of the velocity sec selector and a Bainbridge mass spectrometer is 1.12 times 10 to the fifth volts per meter. So that's E. Volts per meter. And the magnetic field in both regions, this region and this region, is 0 0.540 Tesla. Let's see. A stream of singly charged selenium ions moves in a circular path with a radius of 31.0 centimeters in the magnetic field. Determine the mass of one selenium atom and the mass number of this selenium uh, isotope. So that's what we're after in this case. Um, the mass number is the, um, a lot of times you'll refer to something like, um, say, helium-4, okay? And the mass number of that helium, and this would be helium that has, this is selenium in this case, but it would be helium that has two protons and two neutrons, and the mass number is the four. And the reason that's the mass number is because it's the nuclear particles, the protons and neutrons that give an atom its mass, and that's how many combined protons and neutron, neutrons you have. And often those are called nucleons, at least in nuclear physics. And it's just a generic term. So helium-4 has four nucleons. And we'll be after figuring out how many there are for the selenium isotope. Okay. Um, well, the... Uh, velocity selected for by the velocity selector is E divided by B, so, or the speed in this case, E over B, and it ought to be interesting to see how E divided by B will give us units of meters per second, but let's find out. 1.12 times 10 to the fifth volts per meter divided by 0 0.540 newtons per amp meter. And let's see, well, we can put a number on these, but let's figure out the units that are going to be going on here. Um, if I invert that and multiply, I'll have volts per meter times uh, the meters, well, just do it times amp meters per newton. And a volt is a joule per coulomb. Well, first of all, the meters go away. Um, so I'll have joules per coulomb times, uh, let's see, an amp is a coulomb per second. And then on the bottom, I've got a newton. Okay, so this will go away, a joule per second. Oh, well, a joule is a newton meter. So I've got newton meters per second and newtons on top and newtons on the bottom. Yep, meters per second for this thing. So let's see what the 
speed selected for is going to be, it looks like about 2 times 10 to the fifth, a little more than that. Nope, a little less than that. Uh, right in a little more than that, 2.07 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. So that's the speed that's selected for by the velocity selector. And once it enters, gets through the velocity selector and enters this region here, will be controlled by QVB equals mv squared over r, and we're after m in this case. So m will equal qvbr divided by v squared. Okay, which looks like qbr over v. And we'll see if that gives us units of uh, kilograms. We will have 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs times the magnetic field strength was 0 0.540 newtons per amp meter. The radius that this thing traveled in was 31.0 centimeters, which is 0 0.310 meters. Okay, and I can get rid of those meters, actually. They go away. And B down here was 2.07 times 10 to the fifth meters per second. And the hard part that's left is trying to reconcile all these units and get this stuff to work out. Um, let's see. Maybe I should have left those alone. Anyway, a coulomb per second down here would give me a coulombs. I'll divide out a per second on top and a per second on the bottom. We'll go away and I'll have... Um, Just for a second, I better be careful. Um, but I'm going to do it on the back of something else. Okay. Coulombs times Newton per amp meter times meter divided by meters per second. <sighs> okay. Coulombs times for Newton, I'm going to write a kilogram meter per second squared times a meter. And I've still got that over a coulomb per second times a meter. And I've still got that over a meter per second. So kind of messy. This is a coulomb meter. Per second, so this would turn into a coulomb kilogram meter squared per second squared times a second over a coulomb meter. So these will go away. I'll end up with um, kilogram meters per second and on the bottom i've got meters per second oh good i end up with kilograms so i'm happy i have no idea what the the mass number is yet or the mass is but uh the mass of this selenium ion is going to be let's see
And I get about uh, 1.29 times 10 to the minus 25th, whoops, 25th kilograms. And that's going to presumably equal the, I'm going to use a capital N, uh, oh well, a lowercase n for this, times the atomic mass unit to get the mass number. And what I would get for that mass number and I'm just using the letter N for it. That's not official or anything. But if I divide that by the atomic mass unit, um, 1.667, I get about 78. Um, so that would be about what it is. I've got some uh, uncertainty of two parts in 778, but uh, you can't have fractional numbers of protons and neutrons. And uh, where that comes from is actually in the binding energy of the nucleus, that there's energy in there that, that makes a nucleus have less mass than the sum of the masses of its constituents. And that's because you have to add energy to the nucleus to break it apart. And that's where that comes from. But anyway, um, there's a mass spectrometer, a nice application of a uh, particle traveling in a curved path in a magnetic field. But before it even gets into that part, a velocity selector, which is kind of a neat idea as well. Okay, um, so far everything we've been doing is just looking at the forces that magnetic field, magnetic fields exert on moving charges, and so far we haven't been talking about where those magnetic fields come from, and that'll be what we start on Wednesday, is looking at sources of the magnetic field, and Turns out where those magnetic fields come from is from moving charges. And so magnetic fields exert forces on moving charges, but it's moving charges that make the magnetic fields. And Wednesday, we'll start looking at that. And so we'll stop here. I hope you managed to watch the one on uh, the video on the cork on a current loop and get a little bit of an idea of that and also the uh, magnetic moment of a loop of current so those will be applications as well otherwise are there any questions i'll have your tests graded and back to you by tomorrow and uh, we'll see what happens with that it may be that there's some kind of a makeup assignment on this one so, okay, if there aren't any questions, I'll stop recording here and uh, I can remember how it's been four whole days since I did it last.